So you may recall in early episodes we covered software defined radio and in particular this one which is the new ELEC SDR Smart and that's cool and this dongle allowed you to convert your PC into a radio receiving powerhouse by converting signals from the air via the antenna hole and letting you decode that in whatever way you want or need to be able to show pictures from space, FM broadcasts, pilots overhead or even tracking aeroplanes. The world's your oyster with one of these. And one of the other projects we made was a spectrum analyzer in a box which used effectively the same technology and there's the little dongle right in there and a little amplifier board and all of that. I kind of haven't used this. I built it for one task and one task only and that task's done so I should probably liberate that Raspberry Pi at some point. And those things were cool. Um, I mean, SDR is definitely a very cool thing and a very cheap hobby to get into. Now, cast yourself back to the 90s uh, when this technology was coming out. You remember like pure, you had pure Evoke radios and this when the sort of DAB radio started coming out. And DAB is a kind of a similar thing because that's when you started using digital chipsets to process the digital radio signals and obviously they were like M MPEG-2 and they probably still are in those days in the UK, uh, then and in the UK and you could listen to them and that's what your DAB radio is now. Um, so they're effectively SDRs with a little bit of processing in there but this was a product from Scion right on the early end of that to make something that would actually let you listen to radio those DAB broadcasts on your PC. And you can see it's actually massive. I'm screwing these antennas in. It's really hard to show you. But it would sit on your wall uh, vertically with these antennas up and down. And I, I bought a couple of these. These are the Scion Wave Finders. And then you plug it into your USB and it sucked so much power you'd have to use this Scion AC adapter. So it's kind of cool though that it is an actual Scion product. And it came with this software which was pretty jank actually. So it's still in there. And the software basically allowed you to organize your radio stations as a series of icons and then click them. And when this thing was operating, this, this little thing would give a glow. Uh, I haven't tried it recently, but I'm pretty sure last time I did try to try this that the software really required a 90s type PC running 90s type software. But I'll certainly give it a go. But what's really weird about this, I recall that just there's so little information about them. It's as if like nobody bought these. So I thought, why don't we have a quick look inside? Because compared to the modern SDRs, of course, they're absolutely huge. And yeah, I appreciate that the technology's changed a lot, but I, I really am curious to see what's inside one of these things. So let's get the right screwdrivers and start cracking the lid on this. The right screwdriver. And on the back here, it does say it was 2000. Scion Infomedia, so maybe I was a bit wrong with the dates, maybe it was uh, a bit later than the 1990s, but not much, you'd still be using 1990s hardware. It says made in Austria, powered by Radioscape DAB, so you will notice if you do look at some old DAB radios, they do seem to have these chipsets and systems, I guess systems on chip, that have been brought in from other companies. And the Pures, Pure Evokes, they're particularly interesting because all those things, if you crack the lid on them, they're kind of a bit of, not a mess, but certainly not as integrated as a current modern product. So they were definitely buying modules and sub-modules from other people. So we have this plastic bezel, which is still quite pleasing, isn't it? It's that um, late 90s aesthetic, your kind of IMAX style clear plastic. Or one of those PCs in PC world that they'd sell you that was trying to copy a Mac. And we do appear to have two RGB LEDs located slam bang in the middle. And then there is this antenna bar. You can see it is actually taking the signal and, and putting it either end. And I'm not sure how much we're going to see in here because it's all in a massive can. Uh, two sort of high rose connectors. Taking that board, we can just open that, pop it aside. Look at this thing. So this is shielding. I don't know if it's to stop interference getting in or interference getting out. Sometimes it's interference getting out. And it's held in with these clips. So I'm just being very ginger. I don't particularly want to break this because, again, how often do you see them? It might be something to donate to the old uh, computer museum if I can't get it working. But I think it would be nice to get it working. There's no reason it shouldn't work with the right equipment. 
So I'm not sure what the spec you'd want. It's probably a DX. DX266. I'm going in. Just via a different means. Ah, okay, so that's screwed in though from that side. However, hopefully now that will release the strain relief. Someone got busy on the old computer-aided design when they were messing with this, isn't it? It'd be interesting to know if it was actually Scion themselves, you know, Scion engineers or Scion design team made this, or if they just bought in the whole design. I mean, it's a bit of a departure. Scion were probably just on the tail end of their whole organizers division at that point. There we go. Right, now we've got some meat here. So you've got the USB coming in. And the shielding of the USB is actually connected to straight to that can. And I didn't notice it before, but there is an antenna connection here for an external antenna. And I do wonder if you use the external antenna, if it uh, its performance was, was sort of damaged by having these in there. Now, I do remember, though, when I, I had this, I built my own dab antenna in the loft using copper pipe and wood. It was amazing. It took my pure evoke from virtually no signal to 100% signal. It was absolutely massive. And I did run it on this by connecting the wires in the ends there, and it did work. Mmm, canned goods. Let's just keep going. I think we need to take off the big one. In the little and little in there, I can see just some uh, various doodads, but nothing too important. Mm -hmm. It's quite amazing, really, though, to think that this thing is at least 20 years old. Well, probably more like 25 years old. God knows when they actually manufacture them. You could look for a date code, couldn't you? I'd be very curious to know how long it took to develop. Okay, so that's, that's really interesting, though, this internal mechanism here for separating the innards of the can and locking it. Never seen that before. Okay. Whoa. Wow. Okay. So you're looking at lots of uh, radio gubbins here. I guess it's always sort of zoom in. But that is quite a dense little board. I mean, you can see from the size of my finger, um, they've really packed in all of these components. And it's all going to be down to, to tuning uh, and working with the antenna side. I'm pretty positive this is the uh, side to do with the RF. So all these components will be uh, maybe PLLs and things to control oscillators and gubbins like that. That's the scientific term to, to order to, this to tune. And if we can get the back off, the back off was likely to have the digital stage, which I think is the more interesting part because there's a possibility we might actually recognize something in there. But there's a very big danger. Looking at that can, I think we're going to have to try to unsolder it. So it really would help if we can get the lid off at least a bit to reduce the amount of heat it's going to sink. Because I don't have a big old soldering iron handy. And I can see it's actually got a connector that will be almost impossible to put back on without desoldering that. But I can probably just about get in with my tweezers. Get in there and give it a good old tweeze in. Yeah, look at that. There. Didn't I say it? We had some more meat in here. So there you have your Xilinx. This would be uh, an FPGA. And I don't really know what the other things are. So we do have 48 uh, megahertz crystal power regulator here. More regulators up here. But we would have to go in a bit deeper on this to really know what it's doing. Just been on the internet doing a little bit of hunting and I have got some infos on this. But before I go into that, just check this out though. I did notice this little guy. Hee <laughs> hee! Look, he's trying to escape. Wasn't quite fitted well. Oh dear. Anyway, I don't think that caused a problem on this. 
they had their own problems with getting very bloody hot and you can see why all those chips so yes that isn't an fpj it's a cpld same sort of thing really and uh yeah it's a xilinx x cr3128xl 128 macro cells i guess that's the sufficient number of macro cells needed to achieve dab radio and dab digital apparently this did have the capability of receiving dab digital radio with the experiments of web over dab which i think is pretty cute the other uh chip down here this big boy which is surprisingly big for its capability but you're talking again very late 90s technology is the sl 11r low cost high speed universal serial bus risk based controller and these are a little bit like these contemporary chips that you can still buy today where they are configurable so they have buses that let them talk to other devices and they have enough code code space on board that you can program them to be a bit of a, an interpreter between usb and whatever they connect to so you can imagine that you'd hook up on usb and then it would uh, send commands to possibly the xilinx in this case and then the xilinx in turn would talk to these guys which are digital signal processors two of them and they would create that digital data stream from the radio broadcast and then that would get shuffled through back through the USB um, processing chip down your wire to your PC where it will decode it into sound. And what else do we have on here? We have these 2K 6R1016V1C 64K times 16. You can do the math. High speed CMOS static RAMs. Two of them. It's absolutely jam packed to the gills of all the RAMs. And of course, these guys which we mentioned earlier, which are these DVC 542 GGU fixed point digital signal processors. I think fixed point. I mean, they don't do any floating point, only fixed. And that's good, probably. <laughs> I know, you just times everything by a million and then divide it on the computer, something like that. Which uh, it was interesting about that is that one, these are BGAs. Of course, the, the RAMs are BGAs, but VG, we don't really see so many BGAs on things of this period. And the date, if you get the data chip for the uh, the data sheet for these chips rather, is 1998. So these would have been really bleeding edge for this thing. So I think Scion would have been, you know, really pushing out their uh, engineering department to get this thing smashed out in time. One more bit of digging, Scion Infomedia, and we think, what? Scion Infomedia? I hadn't heard of them. Yeah, I just remember the devices in Argos catalog, the little calculators. Chinny had one, used one at college or something. But boom, go on company's house. Yes, they are dissolved, you know, which I guess we, I assume they were. But what's crazy is, dissolved in 2014. So not that long ago, you know, just under 10 years, like nine years ago. Incorporated in July 1999. So literally, company was set up to sell this product, hit the market and revolutionize digital communication via the radio waves and just, just failed, it did fail. And looking at the internet, they sort of suggested these were available in Curry's, Dixon's type shops for 300 pounds. You know, at the beginning of their release, it was 300 pounds. And then like within a few months, it was 50 quid. Please somebody buy it, please somebody buy it. And then it was discontinued, literally another six months after that. And then by a year later, they totally discontinued the software support for this, which apparently made them a bit flaky to use. Because I have to admit, the software that came with it, this thing, was absolutely terrible. It was really buggy and crashy. And I wasn't sure if it was the software on this or the software on the hardware itself that was at fault. Certainly the later versions were a bit better. But apparently there is a Linux port of it. So you may well get this running. It would work. They, they claim it will work up to Windows XP. So which is really, you know, there's a good chance that you might have a Windows XP machine lying around somewhere. So if you are keen, you could go on the old eBay and see if you can find yourself a Scion Wave Finder. Now, as unlikely as it sounds, I wonder if it would be feasible to actually get this running using a virtual machine. I think it's definitely worth a shot. They tend to have pretty good support of USB devices. So we might fire up the old virtual box and see what happens. If I can get hold, of course, of a copy of Windows XP. As you can see, I actually have managed to get Windows XP running in a virtual box image. I have hooked up the Wave Finder, so let's see. Oh gosh, I want to get Device Manager up and I can't remember how you do it. Oh no. <laughs> 
let's assume it's worked on the USB. But yes, the driver's already on there. I have set them up. I have to find them. They are installed. Let's have a look. Um, yeah, Radioscape Wavefinder UI. Now, do I have enough reservations? Failure. No USB device is connected or the receiver is already running. Yeah, that's off to a bad start. After playing with the drivers a little bit, it seems like we could be in business. There are currently no known channels to show. Please click the scan button. OK, let's click the old scan button. Yes, please go ahead. Alarmingly, I can't see. Oh, no, the Wi-Fi has just burst into life and has a very soothing green LED to show you that it's doing something. Much unlike this actual piece of software. I won't lie, there's been some challenges. So I'm now currently installing the software on a Toshiba Portage 3480 CT laptop, which is quite nifty. Look at the size. It's a very small little thing. And I do have the antenna here hooked up and it does have power and everything connected. So we're just waiting for this application to install and see what happens. I did try to run it in virtualization and unfortunately the receiver just wouldn't scan it would install so this is where it actually didn't work on the virtualization but you can see now the actual progress bar is going up so there is some hope that this is working interestingly though the wavefinder itself the led isn't flashing on it so i'm a little bit worried but let's keep the faith and let it finish testament to the quality of this software apparently it wasn't flashing because the USB drivers weren't installed. And after multiple attempts at installing, reinstalling, uninstalling, trying different drivers, trying different things, the Wayfinder is still very much dead. At the risk of jinxing it, there may be a redemption arc here because the Scion is alive and it's hooked up to this little Asus EEPC and it's currently doing the scan and it's currently flashing the light so two things that i haven't seen happen simultaneously so we may well save this video yet it's literally just stopped whatever it was doing so let's see if we can focus in on this screen and have a go i see two new tabs appeared sdl national and d1 national I don't know what that is so let's try sdl national and look absolute 80s bfbs Sunrise Radio, Virgin Radio. So these are definitely radio stations. I'm going to try the old Hawk Sport because that's less likely to get me demonetized. Let's see if this actually works. Play. Tuning. <laughs> Is it working? I'm not hearing anything. I think we have volume. We're on maximum. Hmm. Yeah, sounds working. Hmm. I've moved the unit around till I've got 100% on this reception strength meter. So let's try one more time. Let's go for, I don't know, a bit of art. This is hot. Come on, hit us with your tunes. But I'm noticing this little indicator on the right does seem to be glitching around. I'm not convinced it's actually getting the data. Yes, it works. Absolutely it works. Wow. So I went through the other one, which is SDL National, and it did start to work. So I think it's to do with signal. If the signal quality is not there, it just will not work. Yeah. Enough of that. Whoa. Look at this. This is interesting. You see how these look, but Virgin Radio has a more funky UI. And then this rock channel has, look, it's like a stone background. So I don't know how all these branding assets were sent. Sounds absolutely awful, but uh, we can put that down to the speakers and this little guy. So great. I hope this video has been of some interest to you because it has been an overall and overwhelming success. Now I can throw all this <laughs> on the shelf that no one dare speak of. Thank you for watching. <laughs>